What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of At Home with Mark. Today is season four, episode 18. And uh, we have Josh Williams from Josh Williams Guitars. Dude, I'm so excited to talk to you. This is going to be awesome. Thank you for making the time, first and foremost. Absolutely. Oh, this is so great. Yeah, I'm super pumped to be talking with you. Yeah, man, this is going to be fantastic. Um, so I always ask people this question uh, at the beginning of every episode. Because I am curious about everyone's paths, right? So, like, what is, like, your earliest musical memory? Oh, man, my earliest musical memory, gosh, is probably driving uh, in my mom's station wagon when I was younger. And all we listened to was, like... Uh, Rod Stewart, Shania Twain. And so that's what I I honestly thought all music was just that. And <laughs> like and oldies but goodies. Like that's all we listened to growing up was the oldies but goodies stuff. Nice. And then but it wasn't until um my dad came home and put on uh the Black Crows and put on like Pearl Jam when they first came out. And I was like, what is this music? Dude, yes. I, yeah. that's my that's my guys, man. Yeah, yeah. and th it blew my mind. It's like, what is this? And then that's kind of introduced me to. I have an older sister, and so then she, when I got old enough, uh, she started getting me CDs and got me like the Nirvana Unplugged and Offspring, you know, and just like things that were popular in the time. And uh, that just kind of opened my eyes up to, okay, there's more music than just oldies but goodies. Yeah. So, um, Dude, it's so interesting because so many people have said like being in the car, you know, yeah. your parents exposing you to. So did either of your parents play? Nope. Nope. Nobody in my family plays music. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, okay. So when did you like first start to think about maybe I might want to be involved with something to do with this? Like how old were you? Like when you maybe started getting more kind of saturated with that stuff? Um, I was, uh, I was eighth grade and my uncle was visiting. And at the time I was kind of into skateboarding and, you know, playing hockey. I was playing hockey a lot during that time, junior high and high school. But my uncle came down and, uh, he, he had said, Hey, uh, I can either take you to the store and we can get you a brand new guitar or we can go and get you a skateboard. And I chose a skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know any better. I was just, that's what I was into, you know? And, yeah. um, but then a friend in high school, it was in ninth grade. Um, he got a guitar for Christmas <clears throat> and, and I would go over to his house to skate all the time. And it's like, what is this? And how do you play this instrument? And uh, so he would, he would teach me some things there. And then I finally got a guitar in ninth grade as well. And nice. then that just took over. I quit playing hockey. And I was just focusing solely on music and playing guitar at that point. So all, all high school years was just come home and hours in the bedroom every single day just playing and playing. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, do you still skate? Like, do you still get on a board? Um, well, I have a son who's just turned 14 and he's just now getting into skating. So I just made him a rail um, this past <laughs> weekend. And uh, yeah, so I, I haven't really gotten into skating because I don't want to fall and hurt myself. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not working at that point, you know, um, but it's really neat to see him uh, get into the, get into skating and, just get super hyped about it. So yeah, yeah that's it's cool. I, it's funny when you say like you can either get a guitar or a skateboard because skateboards back then too. Like I mean, they're still expensive. Um, oh yeah, you know. So it's like when you when you go all in and the trucks and all that stuff, it's like hundreds of dollars. When you're a kid, you don't have that money. I know. I get it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's really yeah. cool. It's fun to grow up like on that stuff and like I still do. My daughter uh, is eleven and we still like rock out like tony hawk on ps4 yeah, yeah. It's so fun man like there's a way that you can't get hurt but you can still <laughs> do something I, I, and well and even taking them to the skate parks i'm i'm here in southern california and um so it's you know incredible weather all the time and there's a ton of skate parks and so it's a lot of fun just taking him to the skate park and just watching him 
geek out on that. And then watch some of these guys at a young age. They're just incredible. Um, so that's, it's, it's nice that I don't have to get onto the board to enjoy it. I could just kind of be an observer and watch it. And that's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's dope, dude. I remember one time I was in, I was visiting friends in Southern California. Like we drove down the coast, stayed in LA for a couple of days. And then my, one of my really good friends from, you know, my youth lived in San Diego and I love San Diego, dude. I just really love that town. But when we were in LA, we were staying in Venice and there was like an X games, like on the beach, like there was something happening and I woke up and I just saw them setting all this gear up and I went out and, uh, sure enough in the afternoon the craziest stuff like half pipe stuff and like just seeing that up close is way different than watching it on tv man yeah it's yeah. so much more intense like i couldn't believe how palpable like the like intensity and the stress was like just like oh this person doesn't get hurt <laughs> you know what i mean like and i wasn't even a dad then but i was like oh my god dude I can't believe yeah. i'm watching this it's just like a whole nother level, dude. Of yeah. Dedication. Yeah. But what, was that in um, like the late 90s, early 2000s or when was that? Yeah, that probably was early 2000s because I had just graduated from college and it might have been like 2003 or four around then. Yeah, because yeah. they did a X Games um, in the town that where we live um in oceanside i was living in oceanside that's where i was born and raised and it's uh right on the coast and and they had the whole x games the downhill luge you know all of that stuff was right yes. in our town it was really neat to just go and watch it every day all day long the big <sighs> you know vert pipes and everything bmx and it was yeah. i was in i want to say that was probably like 1999 or something like that uh, okay yeah yeah it's so fun dude it's like you know it's like almost like having the Olympics in your backyard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in a yeah. way, but way yeah. cooler. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So you're getting into music in high school. Um, at that time, did you take like lessons or were you just like self-taught? No, nope, I took lessons for the first three years. Um, uh, there was a local music shop um, where I was taking lessons from. And it, it just so happened to be the, the guitar teacher. He, um, his name's Greg Douglas, but he was uh, he was in like the Steve Miller band and um, a, like a couple of um, like played with Van Morrison and, you know, oh, wow. some, some players like that um, way back in the day. And so I always thought that was so neat to, oh, I'm taking lessons from the guitar player from so and so, you know. Um, but, yeah, I took lessons for for three years and then I got into I got into the instrumental stuff and listened to, to Vi and Satriani and you know that. And so then I just bought like tab books and, and would just read tab books, you know, hours. That's all I did every day was just play and read books and, and learn that stuff. So, Oh man, that's great. Yeah. So is that like a, a, sh a shifting in kind of musical taste at that time? If you're like getting into more of the shreddy stuff, like were you kind of like intrigued, like what was like, pulling you in that direction uh a lot of it was um yeah the challenging uh challenging me as a player and just getting better because you know a lot of it when i was first starting was listening to a lot of pearl jam and listening to a lot of metallica and stuff like that but then listening to the solos and listening to how they're putting all these notes together and how they're voicing things and phrasing things uh that was just a constant challenge and figuring out how do I get better and better at that. And so then I, it was dream theater and listening to John Petrucci and, you know, all of that stuff. So a lot of it was just to challenge me and, um, and help me understand the fretboard that much more, you know, instead of, uh, playing a lot of chords and stuff, which nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm a terrible player now. <laughs> no, I don't, ever, I don't know how to play guitar anymore. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that, that's that's the main reason for that. And a lot of Andy Timmons, a ton of Andy Timmons. And, and it was a lot of that instrumental stuff to help challenge me and push me as a player. Yeah, he's killing. I love his instrumental Beatles stuff that he does. I know. That stuff is so dope. Um, did you get into like Zappa and stuff like Via Vi? 
I didn't get into Zappa. I did listen to Dweezil Zappa a little bit. Um, I did listen to um, like Blue Saracino and, you know, uh, players like that. But um, no, I never did. Never did listen to Frank Zappa or any anything like that. I feel like he's such an acquired taste. Like he's such he's like the he's a a face that should be on like the music Mount Rushmore in a way. Um, Because, you you know, you talk to a bunch of players and they always talk about Zappa and his influence. But it's definitely an acquired taste. Like you have to be willing to be like in a goofy mood almost sometimes to listen to Zappa. You know what I mean? Yeah, I love it. Like the Mothers of Invention stuff I love. Um but like some of it, yeah, I'm just like, woo, this is <laughs> a yeah. little too much for my brain. Um, <laughs> are you still keeping up with Pearl Jam at all? Because there's some, you know, great records in the past few records. You know, unfortunately, I, I haven't. I would love to. Um, I haven't. Honestly, I've been listening to like a lot of podcasts. And, um, mm. That's that's mainly what I listen. Like if I'm in the shop, um and I, and I see uh, friends come out with new albums or something, you know, someone introduces me to uh, some new music, then I'll put some music on in the shop. But a lot of the times I'm listening to podcasts, you know, or audiobooks. That's, you know, I have my earbuds in and it's just head down and I'm just constantly doing that audiobook, ton of audiobooks and stuff. So that makes sense. I'm sure yeah. that's like very zen for you while you're working with the wood and stuff. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's there's uh, there's probably a lot of stuff um, that I'm constantly challenging myself on or needing to understand more about myself. And that's where the podcast or even audiobooks will help me on that. Um, Dude, amen, man. Like, yeah. I'm right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, the past two years have pushed us in many directions, my friend. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, cool, dude. So. Just to circle back, so high school, were you playing in bands? Were you playing with other people? I was, yeah. Uh, just after high school, I did. Yep. Okay. Um, like pre luthier school. Pre luthier school. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. And what What was the first band name? <laughs> I don't even know if I want to say it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it. If you you can or you cannot. There's no. Uh, it's not censored. Um, it was uh, a band called Waiting for Autumn. And it, that. yeah, uh, it was an emo band. So you got to think like early 2000s, you know, uh, Jimmy Eat World was really big, you know, and uh, Thursday and, you know, all these emo style kind of screamo style bands. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I was playing in. It was uh, a time where I was able to fully escape from what was going on in my life. And I was able to play with other musicians. And all I did was. Uh, many many nights a week we had practice and then played out a couple of times a week and so i did that for a a good while and um yeah that's it probably wasn't my ideal style of music you know it's totally different than you know the instrumental andy timmons stuff um to then playing emo but it was something where there's a core group of friends and Mm -hmm. just staying busy and you know keeping uh keeping my head out of things that i didn't really want to face <laughs> yeah man i hear yeah. you i mean nothing beats playing with your friends dude yeah. let's be real i mean come on that's like it's i always talk about it like in terms of you know it's akin to like being in a foxhole with a you know soldier you know in war yeah. like you get to know people so well um yeah. did you guys what was your first like what was the rig do you remember your rig oh yeah, i do um it was a fender cyber twin so it was like okay do you know what that is i remember those of course <laughs> i do i remember seeing them in guitar center or mars music out here um yeah they got yeah. some shade thrown at them thrown at them didn't they for a while like people were hating on those for a while it's 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 possible yeah um it was like that modeling amp but you know when i was playing i was purely in the bedroom just playing you know and i can have all these different tones and you know different sounds and stuff like that but so then when i got into playing with a band that's just all i had and i just took that with me but i've long since gotten rid of that and um but yeah that was that's that's what i used i wasn't into pedals i didn't 
really buy much pedals. It was just, well, I've got this, everything in a box and, you know, it worked well for the bedroom and probably didn't translate the best live, you know, but I always thought they were way cooler than the line six stuff at the time, you know? Yeah. At the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt like there was like an arc happening. Like there was like, that was a time in the industry where things were starting to like, you know, maybe separate like the tube amp world, the solid state, the digital world was starting to like, you know, it's, it was like a taffy, like a push and pull, like who can get stuff out faster, who sounds better, you know, and then it's kind of escalated into what we know now as far as like the Kemper and all that stuff, yes, um, yeah. yep. which has been a really interesting ride to be on when you think about it. You know, think about like all the amplifiers that have come out from, I don't know, 2002 to now. Yeah. And how many different yeah. things have happened? It's crazy. Have you played through some of the Kemper? I owned a Kemper actually for a while. Um, I do some music for film and TV on the side and I don't have any high gain amps. So I was like, you know, it'd be cool to have one of those. And then I was like, and you know, maybe I could use it live. And I had it for like six months, seven months. And I was like, oh, I just, I don't like it. Mm, (laughs) I really don't. And I, and I was like, I'm going to sell it. And at the time, I had always wanted a two rock like that was like my, you know, my bucket list amp. So I sold that and some other stuff and I got one of those new studio signatures. Um, Love it. And then I've got another one on order that I'm going to sell this. I'm going to upgrade to the Bloomfield, I think. It's such a fantastic amp. Do you have one of those? I do. I have the uh, the it's sitting right here. It's the classic reverb signature. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, Eli. Um, I met I met Eli, um, uh, and we were talking, and um, he got to play uh, Josh Smith's Mockingbird, mm-hmm. and um, and so then for a while, we were just talking back and forth, and um, he's like, "Hey, I really need to get a Mockingbird." And it's like, "Well, I really need to get a two rock." So let- <laughs> <laughs> Let's work something out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, we did some horse trading and man, it is every single guitar that leaves the shop gets played through the two rock. And it's just, it's such an amazing amp. It's so unbelievable. The low end on it is incredibly tight. It's just got this fat bottom end that is, is so hard to beat. You know, the, the, the transformers they're using is, that's that's the magic right there you know and it it just replicates that low end so well to where it doesn't get flubby it doesn't it doesn't fall on its face it stays super tight yeah Um, but it's 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 an amazing amp yeah i have that and i've got um a really nice bad cat um head um and then a morgan pr12 that um Mm. it's, it's a great sounding amp as well i you know, when you when you dime that thing, it just sounds so nice. Um, the the drive on it is it's what Josh Smith plays. You know, it's a, that's the sound, that's the tone he gets. You know, yeah, man. Yeah, his guitar, his Mockingbird was so cool. Art is so cool that like RNG rust color yeah. that you guys got on that. Oh man, yeah. it is killing. But you know what made me when my head turned the hardest. Because when I saw Eli post a picture of his, and yes. I was like, "Damn, dude, that like, walnut, yeah, woo, <laughs> that thing is sexy, bro. Yeah, that, th- that thing is putting in the time." <laughs> wow. Like, it, it, I saw that, and I was like, "All right, I need to get a three thirty five guitar." Like, <laughs> I have, I had this is my number one, and I love it. It's a custom shop that I got from uh, Wildwood Guitars, hmm. so it's like their Wildwood Ten. And I've been a Strat guy my whole freaking life, dude. Like my whole life. Yeah. Um, and I have a telly and this, and I uh I'm a PRS artist, so I have a, a PRS, one of those SE hollow bodies. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're great for the money, dude. Holy crap, they're great guitars. But I have always wanted a semi-hollow, like 335 type guitar. Yeah. Cause it I know it will fit how I play, and I know it will feel good to play. Uh, and I don't have any humbuckers besides that PRS. So yeah, you know, I need to do something about, about that. But yeah, Eli's that walnut. Oh, 
that thing was so beautiful dude like, oh, okay. well done thanks thanks so much yeah that's yeah. that's a fun one that was that was a lot of fun um the walnut ones are always fun to do you know it's, it's a little bit different finishing process mm -hmm. but it uh it just it's so rich looking you know it's mm -hmm. yeah with the gold hardware and you relic the gold hardware just a little bit so it gives it that nice aged vintage look yeah that's fun man do you see do you feel like you still have a lot of like you get giddy like you still like are having every, fun every single guitar Love every it. single guitar is like this is so yes uh, when we see because we have um uh, on the website, you can build, you can fill out like a builder's, um, a build spec forum. It's a little tab on the website. <clears throat> and when that gets filled out, it sends an email to, um, to our email account. And that goes to me. And it also goes to a guy named Russ, who is on our staff. And he's the one that does all the customer interactions. But I still see all the emails that come in of the, the specs that people are choosing. And every single guitar that gets built out, I just read through all the specs and it's like, oh my gosh, this is going to be an incredible guitar. <laughs> I, just, I do. I get super giddy about every single one. That's awesome. um, <clears throat> and I don't know why, I, but we, <clears throat> we put a lot of, you know, passion and heart into every build too. You know, it's not a number. It's, you know, people's names go up on the build wall mm -hmm. and they have a serial number next to it, but we're very, we're very sure to add the customer name next to it as well. Cause we never want a customer to be felt like they're just another number in the build queue. We mm -hmm. want to call out that customer by name in the shop. So when we're building so-and-so's guitar, we always call out that, that name and not the number, but you know, we're every time in the shop, we're always, you know, super excited. And then it allows us to dream up and, oh, what if we did this? And, oh, what if we, you know, did some of these details? And what if we did this? And then we start um, cataloging that stuff and we start building our own builder's specs that, yeah. that we want to build in the shop. And so that just is another layer, layer of excitement for us because now we're going to be building uh, what's called builder's choice guitars. And those are specs that we design in the shop together based on all the excitement we see from customers so that's oh, i love that i just got goosebumps dude <laughs> ah i mean just hearing how excited you are about the process of it because i know it's hard work and i know it's it's probably pretty grueling to like you know being very meticulous over this instrument and making sure everything every appointment and everything feels good and looks great Mm -hmm. so you know when it gets shipped as soon as that box opens people are going to lose their mind like that's i know that's i know you're in that to win it in that moment yeah um and that's that's the quality and craftsmanship every time i see when you guys put pictures up on instagram it always is i always just think immediately like it's functional art oh like, yeah. <laughs> thanks yeah you know it really is like the attention to detail from what i can see yeah. having never touched one obviously it just seems like you can tell you guys put all the grease, all the happy grease in it, you know? Yeah. Um, it's so dope. So did <laughs> you, when you like started doing this, I know, so you went to Lutheran school and then you studied under, um, what was his name? What was the gentleman's name in San Diego you studied under? Uh, his name is Uris Zeltins. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, so when you were, when you were doing that, I know in your bio, you talk a little bit about all of the lessons that you took from that and stuff that you thought you never would have maybe enjoyed the process of like, can you talk a little bit about like, what are the things that stuck out? Yeah, uh, man, it was. Um, so I went to school um, at Roberto Venn and it was like five or six months long every day, 10 hours, every single day for, um, and I had zero experience um working with wood, you know, at that point, I, I'd worked on cars with my dad growing up, old muscle cars, you know, and, you know, all the detail going into building these muscle cars. Um, but I had zero uh, woodworking experience. So I took a lot of the things that um, just working with my hands, the attention to detail, you know, those types of things. And I applied it to something that I was passionate about, which was guitars. 
Um, and uh, Roberto Venn was really good because it gave me a lot of the fundamentals, just like, all right, from the, the ground up, from raw stock to a, to a playable instrument, that was really good. But then what I, what I did was I took that information um, and when I was working with Uris at a repair shop in San Diego, he um, he's the one that that took my my um, my core understanding of how to build a guitar and just built on top of that with um, understanding how to get feedback on everything I'm doing, you know, as as um, for instance, like you can take a flat block, you know, it's it's a really flat block. It's got sandpaper on it, but you know, you can sand it over something, but that flat block isn't going to make what you're sanding. It's not going to make it flat. You have to make it flat, even though you have a flat block. And, and it was, understand, how do I do that? And, and understanding how to get feedback on everything and testing everything and saying, here's what I want and here's what I'm expecting out of the results. But now how do I get feedback on, did I really achieve those results? So those are the things that he was teaching me is, is how do I get the wood to respond the way it's supposed to respond? How do I get something to, how do I get something um, that I'm attempting to do, but how do I make sure it's getting done? Um, mm. I, it would be really, it's probably hard to generalize like that. Um, if you're in the shop, it would probably be a way easier for me to walk you through some of the things, but um, that that's probably the education I got from Roberto Van was really good. The the education I got from Uris was uh, it, you, you can't you can't replicate it. You can't you can't put a price tag on it. It was him and a guy named um, Pat. Pat was incredible. He was a repairman back at the shop too. And I still talk to Pat. Uris has moved to Spain, I think. Mm. I think Uris is in Spain now. But Pat is still in San Diego, and I still talk with him. That's awesome. But, yeah, those those guys have probably changed my whole trajectory on just the way I look at a guitar, the way I approach a process, the way I want to get feedback from it. All of that stuff is is what I got from your from Uris and Pat. Man. Yeah. I mean, and that's like, you know, on the job type training too. Like when you get in like real real world experience. Yeah. Um in a safe environment too, probably for you. You know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cause we were doing a lot of repair work. And so there was somebody, you know, always either checking my work or bouncing ideas off of. You're not kind of in an isolation. You know, you have a group of people that you're working with. And so that was really nice. Um, and then when I when I left the shop and I was building guitars, primarily, um, I, I, I focused on acoustics for a long time. That's what I was doing for years mm -hmm. was just acoustics. But every time I would build an acoustic, I would take it down to Uris and say, Uris, I don't want you to give me a single positive thing about this guitar. I want you to give me the down and just the raw things I need to go back and work on. Just give it to me as, as, as you see. And, um, and he did. And, oh, and then I would go and fix those things and build another guitar, bring it down. Okay. What do I need to fix on? What do I need to work on now? And he would tell me. And then I just did that over and over and over until finally, um, one day I, I brought him a guitar and he said, I got nothing to say. You're a guitar builder now. And it's like, wow, dude, that, that was like a corner, you know, it was just a huge, you know, yeah. thing for me to hear, but also, um, a lot of confidence boosting and it was just neat to hear that, you know? Yeah, man. Um, I, I mean, cause how difficult is it? I mean, it seems to me like. I mean, and I am layman. I just play them. I don't understand how they're made that well. Yeah. Yeah. But um, seems to me like building an acoustic and getting it to resonate and sound, you know, as good as you make them sound, that has got to be extremely difficult. 
And I would think it's it's very different, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it would be more difficult than building an electric, um, especially a solid body electric. Um, you know, but am I am I wrong with that? Because it seems like you started at the harder end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, it definitely is a bit ch more challenging, um, and that's one of the things that he had talked to me first was, um, okay, cool, you can build a guitar, but now you have to figure out how to get that tone wood to respond the way that that tone wood is supposed to, what are the characteristics and the tonality of each in, with that top and that back. Now you got to pull that, that voicing out of those, those pieces of wood. And so that's what he was teaching me. Um, and it is a lot more challenging, you know, cause you're dealing, it's, 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 um, it's a, it's a air pump. It's a big speaker box and it's moving. And so is how's the back plate supposed to respond to the top plate and you know um how much uh movement is supposed to be happening in the top plate and you know you want to make the top just strong enough to stay together but not too strong to where it's going to choke the sound you know you don't want it to implode on itself you don't want it to be too weak where you're going to string it up and the whole thing's going to collapse but you want it to be just strong enough to where it's staying together but it's it's you know maximizing the tone out of that top and that speaker box is just pumping and you know you can move some air there's no substitute for moving air yeah um, and so um and that's that's where you're carving the braces and you're toning you know you're tapping the top and you're listening and you're carving you know material off bracing in very specific areas so that way you can pull some of the overtones or you can you know kill some of whatever you know um whatever tones that you don't want you want a very clear very very identifiable fundamental note to ring through um and so that's the whole idea with with carving the top man um, how many woods have you experimented with and like did you did you use something like is there an example of something like oh this is going to be amazing and then you did it and you're like oh <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really feeling it you know yeah um Oh, that's a great question, man. Uh, my first few guitars I've used, I used some really nice tone woods, but um, they didn't, I would say they probably didn't um, translate as well as I had hoped, but that's just not because of the tone wood, but because of my uh, insufficient skills at that point, you know? Well, uh, like what wood is your favorite to work with for acoustic right now? My that it's probably a toss up um brazilian rosewood always is incredible to work with um and very expensive but it sounds incredible that topped with like a a torrified adirondack spruce top is mm -hmm. it's a magic combo um a really close second runner up is either a tie between zero code or um um african blackwood those mm. two they they sound really nice the zero code it's a i um i have a zero code you want me to show you a zero dude code? yeah man yeah. hang on just one second yeah yeah do your thing okay yes. say hello to a couple people here while you're doing that so bv hey what's up and then somebody in, popped in here josh said heard about your guitars um through jack roosh oh yeah 335 tone to last a lifetime um, and then, oh yeah that's cool and then walter saying yeah with an acoustic it's almost like you're building the amp at the same time as the guitar <laughs> yes yeah. nice yep that's it man that is gorgeous dude yeah this is i don't know if you can see it with the light and stuff but um this book is match. yeah book match it's zero code it's got some really cool um uh, sapwood down the center, but it has a really nice, uh, torrified top as oh. well. Dude. But that, that combination, there's just something about the look of it is total eye candy, but the tone it's, it's a, it's a, it's a true, um, rosewood that grows in, in Mexico and it has a really nice warmth like rosewood, but it has an unbeatable bottom end at the same time. It's got this really nice, you know, punchy bottom end. Um, it, uh, 
to me that that's what I like a lot because I'm not a big strummer. I usually do a lot of picking, and so having a lot of that low end come through is is uh, is nice for me. Yeah. Can you strum once on that? Can you can we get a little low end? Oh sure. Let me a see if it translate. This is um. It's a, it's a trip. It's a double O, so it's a small body guitar. But I love the simplicity of your headstocks too. They're so oh. cool. Yeah, thanks. That's so great. Let's see if uh. Oh man. <laughs> Oh, oh wow, Josh! Not, but... Uh huh. Yeah, I can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great, dude. Oh my god. Um. Well, so let's just talk a little bit about the models too. Let's talk a little bit. So the Mockingbird is is what I am very, very, very interested in. Yeah. Um. And so, so we talked a little bit about like you know you put your deposit down, you you send in the form. And, and then what's, what's the time period now? Like how backed up are you guys? Yeah. So right now, um, yeah, if you, uh, fill out, um, a build spec form online, that email will go to us. Uh, Russ will respond to you. Um, he's way faster at responding than I am. I'm such a slow Instagram, uh, text messages, all that stuff. I'm super slow at. Um, so Russ is really good at responding to people. Um, once the, um, once the details are, uh, are figured out and a price is, um, is quoted, then a deposit is placed. And once that deposit's placed, then your name goes on the build queue or on the build list. So once the deposit is placed right now, we're quoting nine months. Um, and, uh, and we're working as fast as we can um to uh to hit that mark um but yeah we're, we're quoting nine months right now uh from the time the deposit the deposit is placed to delivery okay uh, and then is that the same for all the all the models for each different model all the models yeah because the way we do it is um uh an order will come in and um and customers will go in as orders come in. So whether they're getting an acoustic or a Mockingbird or, you know, a Stella, um, sol whatever uh, form of Stella they get, um, the customers just come in and get placed in order as the, as the orders come in. Okay. And then for us, that was trying to keep it as fair as possible. So that way, if someone puts in an order right now, and we're quoting them nine months for a mockingbird, but then somebody puts in an order for, you know, um, a Stella, and then they get their guitar in three months. You know, we just we wanted it to be as fair as possible for everybody. So yeah. just as orders come in is how we do it. Okay. Yeah. And then I know what's really cool what I liked about because I I was looking at the build spec and everything which you can fill out before this because obviously I wanted to be hip to everything. <laughs> but and I and I'm interested and I want to talk to you more about getting one, but um but the the color, the finish. So how what is the most outrageous thing that you've had requested that you pulled off that you're like, oh man, I can't believe we did this, but it looks great. Um, um there's um you know it's funny because there's um a number, well, I wouldn't say a number of them. There's been a few times where we have customers that will come up with some ideas. And um, I'm such a creature of habit. I I tend to like, okay, I've done this and I know I like it. But um, we've had some customers think outside the box. And it's hard for me to see the end result. And I'm kind of <laughs> like, uh, I don't know if that'll translate right. But uh I'll give it the best shot we can get, we can do. Um, and every time with, without fail, every time it's like, I think that's my favorite guitar. Wow. I, um, there was a guy named uh, Nicholas who got this really cool tangerine uh, colored top, but underneath the tangerine is a 59 burst mm. and a 59 burst on the sides and back and neck but had a really cool tangerine colored top, but the tangerine was 
it was aged a little bit. So it was, it was kind of wearing out and you can kind of see a peak of the 59 burst underneath. Oh, man. And it just turned out so cool. Yeah. Do you spray everything too? Or do you have separate crew that does the spraying? Like do you have an art crew? I, I used to do all the spraying. Um, but when doing that, I'd have to shut down all production and I'd have to focus just on, on spraying. So now what we do is we, um, I have a guy who does all of my spraying um, to where I can still keep production going while he's doing all my spraying. And then, uh, and then I'll give him a batch, pick up a batch and we'll just keep on cycling through like that. Man. So that's been really nice. He's, um, he's been a close friend for, for years, probably, probably 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Um, just a really, really neat guy. So he's, um, we built up a really good, uh, friendship and relationship right there with, with, uh, doing the guitar finishes. That's killer. It's like being in a band with your friends again, man. Yes, That's awesome. exactly. Exactly. I got to show you. So when I, the, the first thing I thought of here, let me see if I can share my screen real quick. Um, let's see here. Share screen. Do, 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 do. Let's do the entire screen. So this is my favorite color of any guitar lately. Can you see this? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. So that is that charcoal frost color yeah. that Fender did for a while i freaking love this combination of that tort guard and this charcoal frost is that something that you guys can do like to do something like this for sure yeah yep okay absolutely. yeah i just love for some reason i don't know what it is about i mean gray is my favorite color that's how lame i am <laughs> like, i don't i don't love bright color like i love gray but like i just always thought the like mixture of that that guard and that color of that instrument is just beautiful with, with like the little elegant touches of cream throughout on the cream binding the cream pick pickup covers yeah it's just so nice yeah that's awesome yeah. dude i i when i bought my um when i bought my custom shop strat after i got it like a month later i was like you know what maybe i should sell my other two guitars and get a custom shop telly and wildwood had a charcoal frost with that, you know, pick guard, but the binding was the tortoise, um, tort shell binding too. And I was like, that's yep. like the thing, man. Um, but like, I find it so interesting how you guys can like, for instance, you know, layer on layer, like come on a bunch of companies to do that now. Yeah. And I never really understood it. I'm like, why would anybody want that? Like, but there's history to that too, of people yeah. doing refins and like, yep and whatnot so i find it really interesting yeah yeah the um the the other guy that um that works with us full-time he's he is such an artistic very creative mindset he's always got these really cool ideas um and so he can see that you know when customers come up with things he, he can see it yeah, you know, all the way at the, to the end. Um, he'll even have really good ideas or suggestions. We'll even get customers that say, hey, can you just build something really cool that you would want to build in the shop? And, you know, I'll go to Mickey and say, all right, Mickey, uh, you know, go to town. It's it's whatever you want. to." And we'll just kind of, uh, you know, I'll be a sounding board mainly at that point. But he's the one that comes up with all the great ideas. And mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we we can do any of that type of stuff. We get, you know, uh, suggestions or ideas from customers all the time. Can you do this color? Can you do that color? Can you do this kind of binding? And yeah, no problem. Cause we're doing everything in house. We're building everything in house. And so, um, if we can't do it, we'll, uh, we'll definitely either try to figure out if we could before we say yes to the customer or, um, or we'll just say, um, uh, we can't, you know, um, yeah. based on whatever material limitations we have or whatever. But I'm sure you guys go to the limit as far as you can to figure it out. Like, it's not like phoning it in. It doesn't sound like your company phones anything in, man. <laughs> so. Well, our, our newest model, the Montgomery, we were getting a lot of people asking, hey, can you do a single cut version of your Mockingbird? And say like, we could, but I don't want to say yes yet because there's so much that we'd have to change our templates, you know, our pressing molds that we use, 
um, our side bending jigs. There's so many templates and molds and forms. And, um, and so it's just thinking through that whole process and with a, a we're, we're swamped with this backlog. So then trying to figure out, can we work extra time to build these molds and build these forms? And then can we test it? And can we, you know, come up with, you know, build in a few of the models and make sure it's tried and true and, you know, mm-hmm. that type of stuff um, before we say yes to a customer. So it's, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you have some of the models right here? Do you have some of your, I do. Um, I've got, um, I've, I've got, I've, this is um, the oh, newest yeah. uh, Montgomery. Yeah. It's the single cut version. Um, this one in particular, it's got a, a little bit deeper body and it's fully hollow. Um, same size as a mockingbird. So it's that 16 inch lower bout. Um, same, uh, same curves as a mockingbird as a 335 style. Um, it's just from the waist up that is, is, you know, different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this one's really neat cause it's fully hollow. It's got a lot of acoustic properties to it. It's kind of got a jazzier, um, kind of a, a jazzier tone. Nice. Um, it's gorgeous. I've got, um, this is the other one, but mm. it's, um, uh, a mockingbird depth, so it's the standard three three five style depth uh, center block. Um, uh, same weight, same everything, you know, just in a single cut version. Um, it's great. You got those those vintage blocks on there on the fretboard. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. that's cool, man. That's so yeah. cool. And then we've been using um, the tone specific. Have you heard their pickups before? I have it. I was going to ask you about that because obviously there's so many people that are making like PAF ish, you know, pickups and stuff. And I've heard, you know, tell me because I, I, I'm not hip to them at all. Yeah. He, um, he's um, tone specific. They're, they're not too far from us. They're probably uh, maybe 30 minutes from us. Um, and I first heard about them from a guy named Ford Thurston who, um, has worked with tone specific and came out with like the bloom bucker, um, model pickups. And, um, and so I tried some of those and it was like, wow, these are incredible. They really have an amazing sound. I was getting, um, all of my pickups custom wound from a guy in Australia and, um, and then, uh, and then I've used a number of different pickup companies throughout the years as well. And, every single one you know every company they great great sounding pickups you know porter pickups sound amazing you know um these ones in particular though uh at least for my style and my flavor that there's something magical about them um it's what we put in jack Roosh's guitar Mm -hmm. um they 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 have some clarity and very like clean crisp articulation but the low end at the same time is very very it's very usable you know it does it's not muddy or anything like that Um, yeah well i trust your ears (laughs) yeah and then they play through the two rock and so that two rock just it uh it doesn't lie to me you know yeah uh it won't lie to me well, you know what's interesting too is um, as far as pickups. So I've had I've been on the prowl, Josh, for a while now for a semi hollow. Like I and I've heard so many people say you got to play a hundred, you know, three three fives until you find the one. Yeah. And then I've heard all the stuff about people like, oh, you got to get the Memphis era, you know, three three five, and you got to get the MHS pickups. Like you don't want to get the stuff that's you know I can't remember what the other pickups were that they were using. Um, but, you know, it's that hunt for that low wind mm-hmm. sound. And then, you know, I played a Collins. It was I liked it. It was it was nice. Um, and then I played uh, a Heritage because mm-hmm. I talked to Jack about those. Um, he was on the show a while back and we were talking about this is how long I've been looking for one is he was on in the fall, like or maybe late last summer. Wow. Um, and he was talking about me about those two, but yours as well. And when I played one, 
the bridge pickup was just anemic. Mm. It just did. And I'm not throw, throwing shade at Heritage. I'm sure they're the rest of their, it might have just been that pickup or something. It might have been a dud. Mm. But it, it just didn't feel like it was like, I like that Schofield bitey kind of mm. tone when I go to the bridge pickup. Uh -huh. And it didn't have it. And I was like, what's going on? Because the guitar feels good. Yeah. But it, like it, it feels like it loses all its ass when you go to the, the bridge pickup. Like the neck felt fine. I mean, I can see staying on the neck pickup for the whole night, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to settle. You know what I mean? Like I want to be able to use both pickups. It sounds like what, what you're talking about. It sounds like both of them are very usable. Very things. usable. Very. I, I'm not a, a bridge pickup guy. Personally, I just I, I'm. It's either neck or middle for me, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, the bridge pickup. It there is no lack of low end in in the bridge pickup. There's, it's it's certainly not a, a neck sounding um, position, but mm -hmm. it, it's it's not anemic in any <laughs> any stretch of the imagination. You know, it's, okay. it's not anemic at all. That's Very cool. Old still, yeah. Um, Hank Stone's asking, what are your thoughts on laminate versus solid top? for 335 saw guitars yeah um everything we're doing uh in the shop is laminate um 335 style um uh that's that's no knock on solid tops um i think there's a number of companies that 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 upcharge for a solid top as like a deluxe version and stuff like that they just resonate different um and what we were after is we were after more of that. Okay, what was that vintage, that golden age era of Gibson, and what, how were they doing it? What was the recipe? Um, uh, and then how, what can we learn from that, and then uh, build off of that? Um, so that's what we're doing. They're a lot more stable, very, very stable, because we're cross graining um, and we're laminating. So we're making our own ply and pressing them into a, on a plate. Um, we do have some plans on coming out with like some solid top Stellas, like solid top carved top versions, you know? Oh, um, snap. <laughs> but, uh, but, but that's different than, you know, having a solid top on a semi hollow. Right. So, right. um, uh, yeah, they're just, they're just different. I, I personally, I, I'm, I'm more drawn to the, the laminate version of it. Um, they're more pleasing to my ear. They, to me, they sound like they have more soul. Mm. Um, some of the solid stuff. There, there's some guitars where you'll play, and it's like ah, it, it doesn't. It feels like it's lacking a soul. You know, it feels like there's just there's no life in it. Right. Um, like so, my experience with that bridge pickup. That's yeah. How it felt. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And like you're saying, hearkening back to the acoustic properties of building an acoustic, you want that. It's a semi hollow. You kind of want it to, you know, move a little bit and push air and whatnot. Yeah. So, yeah yeah um you want to be stiff and rigid too much i would gather you know yeah and the the construction is just like you know it's different um a carved top versus um uh a ply top um mm -hmm. it's just yeah different construction like you said yes yeah, it's, it's, it's a very very stiff and that might not be a bad thing that might be what uh tone you're after and the way you play whether it's jazz and you want something to be there very present and intact but you then you want the notes to be gone so that way they're not stomping all over the next notes as your plane runs um so that might be something that you are after you know but um but for us it the ply just it sounds better to us yeah, yeah totally um bv my moderator popped up the tone specific uh pickups if you guys want to check those out somebody was asking hank was asking about those um, and then back when we were talking about acoustics, BV also mentioned George Grun's favorite is Brazilian rosewood and Adirondack spruce. There you go. So. It's a magical combo, especially the torrified Adirondack. It's it's uh, it's a really really sweet sounding guitar. Yeah, really dude. Is. I I just I, I should send you a picture of this, but my grandfather, um, when he passed. He, he kind of played like not to the level that I'm playing. Like he was just the like sit around mm. and strum kind of guy. Um, but my dad, I mean, same as you, like my parents, like nobody played music in my house. Yeah. I mean, my, they put the record player on, but, yeah. um, but uh, he had, and my parents just gave it to me like 
eight months ago, um, an old 1939 Harmony Vogue. Oh, yeah. So I was like, you know what? I could probably get this fixed up. So I talked to um, Scott Baxendale. You know that cat from Baxendale mm -hmm. Guitars? So he's done a bunch of stuff for like Jason Isbell, Jeff Tweedy, like all oh. those old like catalog guitars, silver tones, harmonies, things like that. Okay. He brings them back to life, but he like takes the tops off, rebraces, like goes the nine yards with it. Wow. Yeah. Um, but so he, when I was going to, when I got, I sent it to him. So he has it. But um, I basically was like, I want to, you know, do this for my grandfather because I, I want to be able to play it and like, have something funky to play with because yeah. i have a taylor 714 that i've had since like 2006 or something like wow. that and that's, that's a great guitar yeah it is it is it's a cedar top and rosewood back yeah. and sides and it sounds great and i have it tuned down a whole step and it sounds like a cannon yeah um but he was like i'll tell you when you get this this uh harmony back you're gonna sell that taylor and I'm like, All right, well, we'll see about that like you know that's that's a yeah. tall order um <laughs> but but it is it's cool there's something about like that mm -hmm. era of wood too you know that's yeah. like that pre-war wood that martin didn't use that was they were giving it to all those catalog guitars yeah yeah um yeah i know it, there's um there's a, a guy who I built a few guitars for, um, and all Brazilian rosewood and he saw how expensive Brazilian is. And so he ended up going on the hunt and buying a bunch of Brazilian sets. Um, but you know, it's, it's so old, you know, and, um, it's had a long time to dry and just all the moisture just crystallize and, um, and just become very stable. Um, there it is a really really it, they call it the holy grail you know of tone mm -hmm. woods and it's for a good reason um yeah. it is it's hard to beat that you know yeah it is there is something magical about it because there's like it has the dark and bright qualities that it's just like yeah. the match you know mm -hmm. that's awesome josh are you you want to do this lightning round get down i want to hold you up forever oh sure, sure. what we're gonna do is i'm gonna ask you 10 questions I'm going to put a metronome on at 112 BPM to create some suspense in the room. <laughs> Nothing to be scared of. It's all good fun here. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you these questions. And then if you want, you can explain your answers. You don't have to, but I okay. love explanations. I love them. Okay. Do not have to do that. Um, but the first question is always the same. Lennon or McCartney? Oh, McCartney. Right. No, Lennon. Lennon. <laughs> Last Lennon. minute. All right. Uh, salsa or guacamole? Guacamole, hundred percent. All right. Yeah. Uh, I live in uh, the avocado capital of the world. It's Fallbrook, California, and yeah, the, all the time. Good on you. I would. I put it on everything, dude. Yep. I mean, I love guac. Um, yeah. uh, three, three, five, or three, four, five. Three, four, five. Okay. Yeah. Freddie King, baby. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, for fingerboard, rosewood or ebony? Rosewood. Yeah. Uh, I like. I I like I like ebony. It's a very stiff wood, so it makes the neck really nice and stiff, and that's a really good thing. Um, there's something about the a really nice cool grain rosewood the fret fretting it is way nicer refretting it is even nicer um, <laughs> so is fret that, work a pain in the ass is fret work just awful no i it's not. there's there's definitely things you want to watch out for and there's there's best practices for sure there's things that you have to do and, and must not do um but when you have a really nice fret job and you look down the side of the, the neck and everything's just lined up so nice, it just looks like a piece of jewelry. You know, it's just, <laughs> it looks so cool. But that tied in with a really nice rosewood fingerboard that has some of the rich grain to it. To me, that's, that's, that speaks to me over the ebony. Personally. Okay. I can dig it. I can dig it. 
Um, all right, when you're a kid, you prefer a tree fort or a pillow fort? Or oh. now, as an adult? <laughs> uh, I would say uh, trees were probably my favorite thing doing, climbing, climbing trees, for sure. All right. Classic sunburst or cherry? Classic sunburst. 59 burst. All right. Yeah. Root beer or ginger ale? Root beer. Thousand percent. All right. Austin Powers or Wayne's World? Oh, Austin Powers. Did you Austin see Powers. have you seen Austin his Powers. new show on Netflix? No. Uh -uh. Oh my god, dude. I don't watch much TV. <laughs> oh, okay, dude. Oh, I was laughing so hard last night. I haven't seen Mike Myers do anything in forever. And what's the show? It's called Penta Penta Verate. It's like a comedy based on like a secret society. And it is stupid funny. <laughs> I was laughing. My wife came and she's like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> um, all right. Uh, on, a, on a Les Paul or on a 335 really, uh, bass guitar, do you prefer a pick guard or no pick guard? Pick guard. I okay. Do. Yeah. Especially on the Mockingbirds. They, yeah, they, they look nice. cool. They look cool without a pick guard. But it's not a Mockingbird until you put a pick guard on it. Yeah, and the script of the logo on that is pretty dope yeah. too, dude. It looks awesome. <laughs> Who does all that stuff? Who does all of like your design stuff, like all your like graphics and whatnot? Um, so the logo and um, the little label that goes inside, I hired a um, uh, a graphic designer to come up with that. Um, the the script on the pit guard for the Mockingbird that was just a friend of mine. Um, he drew something up and. Said, here you go that's and awesome. say yep yeah, that's it that that'll work <laughs> i love that thing it looks yeah. great uh all right last question sometimes this is the hardest sometimes this is the easiest if you could take one album it does not have to be your favorite album of all time if you could take mm -hmm. one album and erase it from your memory just Ooh. so you can go back and experience it for the first time again what album would that be um it would be a pink floyd album okay now it's just between animals or dark side of the moon i think okay probably i would love to experience dark side of the moon again for the first time put headphones on i think that would be a lot of fun yeah just man to hear all the tones and everything that's going on around there and all the people talking and here's everything that's happening. I think it'd be fun to experience that again. Cause you don't get that anymore. You know, if you had to erase that from your head, yeah, you, you don't, there's nothing like that right now. So it'd be fun to experience that again. Nice. Well, congratulations. You made it through on stage. <laughs> the lightning round get down is over. You nice. know what, man? It's funny. Um, I think pink Floyd is the most, requested mm. band in that question because i always really? ask that question is yeah so and several people who i did not expect to say that like gabe dixon who's in the tedeschi trucks band he's the keyboardist in oh. tedeschi trucks oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. he said dark side and he's a huge elton john fan i thought he was gonna say like an elton record like tumbleweed connection or something like that yeah and he he dropped that and i was like i was <laughs> not expecting that to come out of your mouth but yeah. it's an interesting concept. Like, there's several records I would love to just go back and listen to for the first time again. Like, what would be it. yours, dude? I a lot of people think it's ten. Honestly, yeah. ten is ten is not my favorite Pearl Jam record. I'm actually getting a tattoo. Um, my first tattoo as a 42 year old man. Um, next I Friday. I hear it's a big I know, <laughs> but see, here's the thing, Josh. Is I'm already addicted to gear. Yeah, and that's more important to me than ink. But yeah. um, I've been talking about getting a tattoo for like 12 years, 15 years, and I just haven't done it yet. But uh, the album Yield, which came out in like 98, is my, I think, my favorite record. So I'm going to get that stick man, the Pearl Jam stick man. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. With a yield sign underneath of the stick man. So it's like my favorite band, my favorite record. Nice. Kind of thing. So I love that album. So Yield would be one of them. But um, uh, are you into power pop stuff at all? Like, I'm talking like heavy power pop, like Jellyfish. I, I don't know who they are. So you should check out. There's an album. They're like Queen and the Beatles. 
okay. mixed together. But um, there's an album called Spilt Milk that is just, I mean, it's glorious. There's just like so, like talk about pop some headphones on and listen to it. Yeah. And they were, that album came out in the 90s, right in the middle of grunge. Wow. So it was like, they were the antithesis of what was going on at the time. Okay. Um, but so far ahead of what was happening that time in music like mm, harmonically jellyfish. jellyfish yeah okay so check that one out it's it's really good it's really yeah good. well so, i'm gonna go listen to yield right now in the shop i'm gonna go check that one out too hell yeah man <laughs> um josh dude thank you so much for doing this i mean it, it was more than a pleasure i really appreciate your time oh man thank you i i get so nervous about and i even told you of her instagram and you don't want to talk to me. I'm super boring. <laughs> no, you're not. And uh, I just get like super, um, uh, super nervous talking to anybody. So, th but this was great. This was so fun. Super great to to talk with you and and just yeah. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. We all had fun, and it, it lives in perpetuity on the site. So you know, if you want to share and tell people to watch, because you are great to hear talk. <laughs> Thanks, um, do man. so, but hang tight, Josh, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And we'll see you next time.